Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for being here this afternoon. I'm very happy to have a chance to speak with you. My name is Brody O'Brien. I teach high school art and every once in a while high school English when they call on me to do so. Um, I am uh, not going to be speaking to you guys so much about art practice or about, welcome, please, come in. There's a couple spots over here. Uh, about, I know the, the, the lecture or the, the talk, I, I want to think of it more as a talk, so as questions arise, please feel free to ask, and have, we'll have a little bit of a discussion if we can. We're not going to be talking about art practice or the, the nuts and bolts of running an art gallery as much as talking about how to get from where most of us or most of you might be in your practice to having a district art, art gallery. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions just to begin with. I am going to um, be using this outline, but not strictly. Um, I typed it up as a way of having um, some moments for you guys to, to walk away with some stuff. Um, but this probably isn't my normal mode exactly. I, there wouldn't be any of this information in here. There might be just be some topics. So first of all, if I could just ask a couple of questions. Um, how many of you have a district-wide or a site art gallery already? So you guys are right with me. You have the experience and the knowledge, and you're, you can add to this conversation as it evolves, I'm sure. Um, for the rest of us, I know that I'm going to be kind of speaking in broad terms. And I am only doing that out of convenience. I, I understand and that you have your own experiences and practice. And I'm not trying to kind of place you in, in a, a moment that is somehow deficient or something like that. But uh, I've been teaching approximately 20 years, and uh, I have a background in community organizing and labor organizing that goes back prior to that. And I have a master's degree in community organizing and teaching, and I have been practicing uh, labor. I, I'm on my, I'm in my teacher, my, my my teacher's union as a uh, negotiator and a organizer. And I've been doing that for a long, long time. So I'm going to be talking through that lens. And the thing that I want to share with you is that it wasn't until about four or five years ago, I want to say truly it was about four years ago, that for some reason I understood that I had been living this kind of weird separate lives. I'm a community organizer and a labor organizer, and then I'm a classroom teacher. And none of the experiences that I have and the you know, kind of practical things that I've learned as an organizer had I been applying to my practice as an educator in terms of advocacy. And it's really, it, I don't know why it took me so long to kind of just wake up and understand that they didn't need to be separate. But that's kind of what I want to talk to you guys about today, is about how it is that you can go about this process. So one of the first things I, I just would like to kind of ask or speak to, has anyone ever heard like the phrase, I just want to teach? <laughs> I just want to teach. So I've heard a lot of, as a labor organizer, we have this thing that's happening and we want to get everyone out to participate because together we can share and improve things for the district. I just want to teach. And it's like an absolutely legitimate feeling and experience and thought, but it is really limiting because it's not the world we live in. And there's a little quote at the bottom that everyone has probably seen at least a hundred times, but it says, just because you do not take an interest in politics, doesn't mean politics won't take an interest in you. So that's going all the way back to uh, ancient Greece. But for us, I think it's really, really relevant because at our site level and at our district level 
and in our community, people are making decisions that affect your classroom, whether it's the dollars that are being allocated to your classroom or the curriculum that is being offered in your school or district. And you guys are the experts. And if all we do is say, I want to teach, then we are, we are not serving our students the best we can because we are not providing that other component, which is taking our expertise and sharing it with those who are making decisions to affect change in a positive way for your students, right? So I know many of you have either said or felt that, I just want to teach. And it's not because any of us are apathetic, it's just that we become enculturated to the idea that we don't have power, that we sit in this room and we've got power with our students and we've got the ability to affect lives with our students. But we think of the other places as this kind of no tread zone that we don't go to or that we don't want to kind of conflate those two worlds because hey, I just teach, this is what I do. Other people take care of that. I'm not political, that's another one, I'm not political. And I'm not talking about, and you guys are clearly understand, I'm not talking about Democrat, Republican, I'm talking about advocacy, because it is political to figure out who's gonna get money based on those decisions that are made at the site, district, and uh, community level. Some of you have uh, art galleries already. Okay, just a quick show, how many of you were involved in starting that art gallery? involved in starting the art gallery. It wasn't there, then you guys came in and advocated for it and got it started. We have one, all right? We kind of started a program at, at, I worked for a county school. It was okay. a county art program. Okay. So scary. But we don't have a set gallery. But you're having art shows? Yes. Okay. And so in that process, you had to navigate uh, Organize and navigate and yes. I just have a question. When you're asking about district galleries, are these like at the district office shows or at a school show or at an actual gallery space? Okay, so for this purpose, I would let you guys decide what is going to be best for you. At my district, we have now a dedicated art gallery that is, it's small, it's 24 feet by 26 feet but it's got 10 feet ceilings, there's nothing in it, it's got polished floors and it's got track lighting and we put art shows in that and nothing else. And so we have advocated for a space that had been sitting empty for a long time uh, to be transformed and that's what we did and we made an art gallery and we've incorporated it at the secondary level. We're, we're hoping to incorporate it K through 12, we're a K-12 district or TK through 12 district but we haven't reached that, we're still a work in progress. So right now it's the Secondary Arts Collective, which we call ourselves. There's art teachers from every school that get together, and we'll talk about that process in a minute. But we've located, because we are a district that is in declining enrollment, we have a lot of space, and we, have, we said that space is just not serving our students, and we created a art gallery. But years ago we did it where we just emptied one of the teacher's classrooms and just put the art up on the wall as close to an art gallery as we could. It was limited in time and how it could, long it could be up. But we do what we can. And I think any of those answers is appropriate for your school site and your school district, depending on what state your, uh, your school situation is in. Okay. But my point being is that most of you haven't started an art gallery yet. And if you're interested, it really just takes your excitement. You are the person you're here, and if you're wanting to do this, that's enough. Wanting to do it and having desire is enough. You won't accomplish it alone, but you will become the energy and the excitement for everyone else to do this thing. So even if you are one teacher at one school and no one else in the school and no one else in the district is interested, you can start and build from where you're at and you have the capacity to make things happen. And I think it's important to note that 
you are going to be grinding up against established cultures that are in your school district. And this is another question. And I, once again, it's a broad stroke. I know that many of you have really supportive places, but how many of you are secondary art teachers? Okay. So as secondary art teachers, middle or high school, how many of you have had students that are just placed in your classes any time of the year without regard to any sort of, uh, I guess, convention or, yes. yeah, a lot of us, yeah. That's because the established culture in our K-12 systems thinks of art as something that's fun and extra. And it's been my experience that that is something that is not just statewide here in California, but pretty much anywhere you go, there's a big discrepancy in public education between the fine arts, visual and performing, and say other coursework, people will call it core courses, English, math, science, history, yeah, social science, and what we do, and that it's, Remarkable that that happens because if you go to any university or community college, that argument, is this valid or not valid? Are the arts something worth in, like pursuing? That's, that's not in question. They're usually the most funded departments in every university, the best funded departments. And they're doing amazing things because they know that people pursue this and follow up their pursuit with a job doing like what you're doing or in design work or um, the any kind of creative work that you, you and I can imagine. But at K-12, it's just this fun extra thing. And so when we're talking about our organizing, and this is an example of me jumping around, all right, you guys? We are going to be focusing on a couple of different uh, groups. We have to focus on an internal group, which would be our colleagues that are other art teachers that we want to get on board with us to talk about and create a movement towards making this art gallery. And then we have to talk about organizing and focusing on this external group, which is our site and district administration or possibly even our community, to teach them the value of what we're doing and how this will translate into something that improves the outcomes of our students. So you've got your internal organizing, that's your colleagues, and I'm speaking specifically about your other art teacher colleagues. And then there's the external, that's kind of like everybody else associated with the school district, right? So that could be other teachers in other disciplines, or it could be site administration. Really it's going to be counselors a lot because counselors need to have an understanding of how this pathway is going to be um, authentic and reasonable and something that's going to be beneficial to those students, not just the AP this or because we teach AP art history, we teach AP studio, and those are kind of thought of okay, but then the rest of our coursework is these classes where they just put kids. It's, it's a holistic program. You teach amazing things and your students benefit from what happens. And if we can grow everyone to understand that, the whole process will be elevated. Right. So we have first this internal and external idea of what we're up against. Um, we have this notion that some people value the artwork and the student process that is going on in our classrooms, but others think of it as, and I don't want to use pejorative language, a place to put students. I know people use dumping grounds or other, but it's a, it's a convenient place to put students that have come in late or are having problems in other classes, and it's not thought of as something that has this kind of um, structured growth that starts at one point and has scaffolding just like every other course and ends with an outcome, just like every other course. And so 
getting our pe our peers and our colleagues to understand that that's important. Please, there's room right back there. There's a spot. I think there's a spot right over here. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> to achieve these things, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about organizing methodology. Right. And so, the most important thing in understanding organizing, we're going to talk about some some structural stuff that you can do, but the most important thing is having a relationship with people. Relationships are everything in organizing. Um, when you meet with someone, the importance of seeing that person and knowing or getting to know that person and ultimately affirming that person is going to really be a pathway for you to achieve your goals in whatever it is your vision is for this art program. And so, relationship is everything. Please think about this as an extension of your students. Um, not that we are going to be walking around with this like, I know everything and I'm going to teach you as I walk through the world. That's not the idea I'm trying to share here. The idea is that as an educator, I, I'm going to assume you have this ideas too, but I understand that when I teach my students in my classroom that the transference of knowledge happens only when there is in relationship. So if I'm not in relationship with my students, they might memorize the information shortly and be able to recall it for a brief moment, but if I'm in relationship with them and I share something with them, they're going to think about it, know it, and internalize it in a different way than if I just had no thought about them at all and they thought about me as just this computer that was just bringing up stuff and sharing it with them. So when we are trying to affect change with our colleagues, with our administrators, we have to see them, get to know them, and spend time with them, and build relationships with them. And it's important because that will become the first level of advocacy for you once you've built those relationships. And so there's a couple of different things you can do. And I, on this page, I, I talk about, um, let me see if I can find it on here. Oh, under organizing basics. You have a vision, but you need partners to realize that vision. The second bullet says hold relational meetings. There are two basic kinds of meetings that you hold when it comes to organizing. One is called a, and these are real technical terms, one-on-one, -on -one, where you meet with someone, one-on-one, -on -one, and then you have small group meetings. Um, so small group meetings usually are eight to, 14 people and you have a topic and you kind of lead the discussion but everyone has a chance to speak and you kind of guide the conversation and you're trying to get a message out and learn something from your participants. All the same techniques of seeing, knowing, and affirming are applicable to both conversations. And, you know, once again, I'm, I, I want to just state to all of you, I'm saying really simple things. And it may seem like this is obvious stuff, but I, I implore you to try thinking about purposeful conversations like this as you're trying to do things. If I ask any of you, if I come up to Nicole here and say, I would love to have lunch with you uh, next week to discuss this thing I'm interested in doing, I'd like to, to try and build a uh, district level gallery somewhere, would you be interested in having that conversation? She's going to say yes or no. And then if she says yes, she knows that I've purposely sought her out and that I'm interested in having a real conversation that is about this topic. And I go through the process of trying to get to know you. And then once I've gotten to know her, I would say halfway through the conversation, I might start to talk about what my interest was at that point. But I can't just come in and bulldoze people and not have an interest in their life. 
because everybody is going to want something at some point in return. And it's not because they're selfish and that everything has to be negotiated in, that, in those terms, but relationship is like that. If all I ever do is come over and see you and ask you for things, you're going to lock the door before I ever come in. And that relationship has been soured, and then you are going to spread the word that I am a taker and I will not do it. And so everything has to have some reciprocity and has to have authenticity, right? I'm going to kind of just start tying some of this to the purpose, and that is... If you want to achieve this, you have to be speaking in your district's language, as well as using these organizing techniques. Now, how many of you are familiar with PLC? Are you all from California? Yeah. It's like the biggest thing going, and I have many thoughts on it. But we, some of them are very positive, and some are not. Um, the, the PLC group that we run in the the fine arts group at Azusa Unified, which is right here, is super powerful because it's us, the eight art teachers in the district, secondary art teachers. We have navigated to the point where we've asked Ed Services to give us one release day per triad. We get a sub day to get together and discuss what we could do to make ourselves better. It is a true professional learning community. I don't know if anyone else teaches other subjects besides art. I teach English as well. And when you operate in some of those other PLCs, there's a lot of top-down structures that don't allow for organic conversations to grow what you think you could do. But if you have the opportunity, and most of you will because you are art teachers, to go to your ed services superintendent and say, we would like to start our own PLC group. There are probably two to four days where you guys already have release time where you go and meet with the district and then everybody else goes and does some training and you sit there and don't do anything. Or you try and do the same training as other people but it is not applicable to what you guys are teaching. With some one-on-one -on -one relationship with your ed services, with a group of colleagues that have a like mind, you say, I'd like to start, we'd like to start a PLC, a professional learning community of just the secondary art teachers or all the art teachers or the visual and performing art teachers so that we can improve our outcomes for our students based on our experiences and what we know. They might not say yes right away, but they probably will say yes if you build an authentic argument and have an authentic relationship with those people. And then that's the starting point for which you can start doing all these great things. So under our profession, under professional learning community down here, I kind of talked about this is exactly what we do. So our teachers meeting regularly in collaboration. So we do that. We're improving the dis district's visual arts programs through collective inquiry. We are looking at what is the practice now. We take everybody's experiences, we wrote them down we collected that data. We have con having construction, uh, constructive conversations about instruction and learning, what's taking place in our rooms. And then we're using that qualitative data to improve student outcomes, right? So what we did with our professional learning community, we said not enough of our really good students are getting into art school. We have tremendous art students. So there's a breakdown between when our students go through our program and when they're leaving and going off into their life. And so through this kind of process of navigating our current ex practice and experience and taking and recording that data and then discussing what we think might be where we'd want to go, two things emerged. We said, we're not sure why that's happening exactly. So let's contact some local colleges. And so we talked to APU, Art Center, and um, Otis, and Citrus College. And we set up field trips for the teachers 
the eight of us went and met with admissions and current department te uh, professors in those colleges. And we wanted to see where, where is it that you want matriculating students to be when they leave our classroom. And so we could see where the holes were in our curriculum, in our program, and where the strengths were. And so what we realized after meeting with the different schools is that we don't have a kind of structured path that helps them leave high school and prepare a digital portfolio to submit to college. And we learned that we have weakness in our digital program overall. If you took our students and you placed them next to second year students at Art Center, in the Art Center, you guys are familiar, have like I don't know, nine or 10 different um, field groups. But if you go into the fine arts field group, their smallest, it's going to sound counterintuitive, but the art school, art center, the smallest group is fine arts. There's about 80 students, which is traditional art school. You know, not design, not product development, all that stuff. Traditional art students, you, you take our best students, they could stand side by side with the traditional art students at art center. They're doing the right stuff, they're doing the right things, that we're producing because all of us are older art teachers and have experience and we're producing that kind of student. But we didn't have the support to provide the digital platform for them or the practice for the digital platform to get them from where we were to those schools. And so we saw our deficiency. We were mapping our assets, all of the teaching, all the teachers, all the things that we're already doing, and then we were mapping our deficiencies so that we could show the district how we needed to grow. And one of the things that we developed was having an art gallery. And through having the art gallery, we decided that having juried art shows was going to be a way to elevate practice for students. And it was absolutely essential and it was amazing at how much our students improved by having outside jurists from the art world, we live, I don't know if everyone lives around here, but many of you do, from LA come and be a panel of jurists for our art students so that students would make work, submit work, and go through that process and see I made it or I didn't make it, and then have to iterate and understand what they had to do to grow to make it for the next one if they didn't get into the art show. And, you know, as their art teacher, we talk to these students about these things. But the authentic experience of having people who work in the art world come and do that is so much more powerful. You know, it's kind of like I tell them every day, it's, I'm, I'm dad telling them to eat their vegetables. When we have critique, they go through it. But it's more powerful when we have three people who come. Yes? Um, I don't want to interrupt, but I do have a couple questions about this. is so cool. Um, how, you mentioned the space is quite small. Yes. How many shows a year do you put up as an opportunity for the kids? And then how long do you keep those shows open to the public? Uh -huh. Jury to get into the show, or is it jury once they're in the show? It's jury to get into the show. Jury to get into the show, so mm -hmm. there's maybe 20, 30 pieces of that? Okay, so like I said, my epiphany or my understanding of how I should be running things as a organizer teacher happened about four years ago. By the time we had the art gallery was about a little over two years ago. We have had two years of art shows. Our first year, the gallery finished a few weeks before the art show. And so two years ago, we had one show. It was a juried show at the end of the year. It was a culminating show. All the students submitted that wanted to submit work to the show. And we had three uh, guest jurors come and curate the show. And how we run that show now and how we're gonna run that show, the, it happens to be that I have an art, my room, my art room is right next to the wood shop that is no longer in existence. 
There has been a room 12 years empty, a giant wood shop. In between my room and that room is the wood shop's former classroom, 24 by 26 or whatever it is classroom. It's got ceilings taller than this, about up to the, the second level of ceiling there. And we, we had them tear out the normal classroom stuff, the whiteboards and kind of the internet stuff, and they, we had the district pull all that stuff out, and they made it into an art gallery. We had our first art show that was juried there, and we had so much work. What we decided to do was take my classroom, and it's kind of the overflow, and we took everything out of my classroom, and I've got a very big classroom, probably about twice as big as this room, and that space gets transformed into an art gallery as well. All the extra pieces that didn't get selected, people that made stuff for the show, submitted it, that didn't get selected, and there's usually a, there was another 100 to 25 to 150 pieces extra. About 25 to 30 get into the art show, the rest are out in this space. The art show is up for about a week and a half or two weeks. And all of the art teachers will um, do gallery hours after school. And then um, because it's right next to my room, the gallery hours during the day. Other teachers from other schools can bring kids over on if the district will get them a bus or something. But people like employees from the district can come all day and come in and look at the art gallery because it's just adjacent to my room. It's not in my room. And so one to two weeks, the art shows are up. Um, we only do that overflow for the juried end of the year show. The second year, which was this past year, we had three art shows in there. And that was, we had a faculty art show, because we thought that would be an authentic thing to teach our students that we make art and show them that. And so we had a, a faculty art show in January, and then we had a themed art show in February, which we called the Red Show, but it had nothing to do with Valentine's Day. We just made it the Red Show. And then we had our end of the year cure, uh, curated art show. The, all of the shows are curated on some level. So next year, we have five art shows. We're doing a collaboration with APU on one of them. We are doing the theme show and the end of the year show, and then we're going to have um, another um, faculty show, because we think it's important to show new work and that we continue to make work. And we have one show that we don't have, we've got it on the calendar, but we haven't decided what it's gonna be yet. But there's going to be three student shows and then I think we're gonna do something with a guest artist. And so we're trying to grow constantly. All the shows will be up for one to two weeks, um, depending on uh, what's going on. I, I'm, I'm getting a little far afield, but just to share with you a little bit, um, to speak to some of those deficiencies about getting kids into school, I've written up a class, and it's just going through the process of being adopted by the district right now. And that's a two-semester class. The first semester is similar to AP uh, Studio, in that, but we're gonna have students working on building a portfolio for college. So it's gonna capstone, a capstone class. And then the second semester, it'll be gallery studies where they get to start doing the curating for one of those shows and going through the process of installation and all the nuts and bolts of advertising and organizing all of the things that happen on our, you know, the opening day and all that kind of stuff. So the whole process lends a level of authenticity to our program that wasn't there before. Having now had four art shows in the space, the kids have grown tremendously in that short time the output is much, much greater. And we have these moments of conversation that we can point to about how pieces were selected. The curators at our last show came to the show and were talking to students after the fact, after it was installed, parents, everybody. And so by doing this thing, it wasn't the only that we thought, oh, this will be really cool to have an art show and have an art gallery. We're trying to build authentic experience for our students so that they can move on to either working in the art world or going to college. Because as you know, there's this whole track of college and career readiness. And if we speak in those languages, and we should be, because that is what is going to authentically prepare our students to move on from us. Yes. So you say 
city of guest curators, did the students have any participation in the installation of the artwork or setting up the gallery? Yes, but the curators selected the work. Okay. So curators come and decide who's going to be in the, the art gallery and who's going to be in the overflow spot for the end of the year. The other shows that we've had so far were curated by the art teachers because it's really hard to secure people to come for the smaller shows. Yes? Do you have ideas for like, our site is so overlooked with people and staff? Like we've got two to three staff in one classroom at times. Okay. Like they're building portables and like that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so like, there's literally, there is a program in our closet on our campus where, this, where I can pull this off. Um, what would be the next step? Because I'd like to... Community partnerships. So, uh, where do you teach? Uh, up in the Bay Area. Bay Area, okay. So, there are uh, no doubt. I, I have um, a contact that I could probably pass along to you. I put my email down on the back of the back page. Um, but community arts programs and uh, partners, there are people, um, there, are going to be, there are going to be lots of people happy to engage with having your art in their space. Um, we've had, before we got the space, we've had local, um, I'm going to call this, we've had everything from like a VA, uh, not a VA, a VFW house place uh, to a, um, a sports pub in the city that wanted us to have our artwork there. And we had uh, a local, um, politically active person that has a lot of land in Azusa come and offer us a building and say, well, that space is too small. 25 feet by 25 feet isn't that small. That You're going to hold 30 to 36 pieces in that room, and it's going to be a, a good size for a student gallery. Because we're trying to, I mean, without trying to sound, this isn't one of those art exhibits where everybody makes something and it gets put up. We're trying to place a moment in our students' thought process where they understand that they have to grow and iterate their process so that it, it gets to a higher level of uh, product. And so that's what is making this part of this plan because we can integrate it into our college and career readiness and say these are the way we're integrating with our colleagues outside the art world. And so um, I think that it's important to have uh, some partners outside the city or outside of the school district in the city. And you can do that a number of ways, but one of the easiest ways is probably um, maybe emailing the Arts Ed Foundation or something like that. It's a California collective of uh, uh, people in interested in growing the arts in California. Yes? I'm really scared about what we're going to do, and I can see a lot of this happening for them. Okay. So then organizing it and doing their service hours without doing this and that and the new You are the expert and the person in the classroom. They can be your partner, but, and this is the thing that I've been trying to start the conversation about, is that each one of us, I'm a terrible public speaker, and I'm here in front of you talking about this because it's important. I am a really powerful organizer. It doesn't matter about your skill level, but what you do have to understand is that you are authentically doing this advocacy work for your students, and they're not going to take over for you. You're going to work in partnership with them. I'm going to work partnership with them. I mean, like there's some other little bodies that don't have to worry about me doing anything. You need partners. Yes. That's, so that's, that's the mindset. Yes. You need people to help you, but you don't ever want to feel like they're going to come in and take over because your vision has the expertise of your place and your relationship with your students. And other, I know, we kind of jumped around a lot, but we got a lot of the basics. Is there any other questions that I can answer? How do you fund or fundraise for the matting and framing of all our work? And that's a great question, an ongoing question. <laughs> um, I'm going to be completely honest with you guys because 
Um, this was so important to me that I broke my own rule for the last two years, which was, as a labor organizer, I tell teachers never to pay for anything, ever. And I, last year, spent over $900, probably $1,100, if I'm being honest with myself, on preparing those art shows. Um, I purposely didn't bring a slideshow. I didn't want to cloud our minds with like visuals. I wanted us to talk about the nuts and bolts. But posters, postcards, catering on the day of, all that stuff, even if we're just buying the stuff and doing it ourselves, it's a lot of money. And I easily, myself, spent in the last two years probably around $1,500 or $1,600. At the end of the school year, after the final show, the eight of us got up and spoke at the school board and said, this is what's happening. You allowed us to do this work as a PLC. We have grown and we showed them, we brought them paperwork of all the different measurable outcomes that we set for ourselves and what we've achieved, all the partnerships we've developed with the local colleges. And we said, we need you to develop a budget for us so that we can do this work without it being hurtful for us. And so, Ed Services came back to us a couple days later and met with us and said, look, this is how we can pay. We can get you a PO and pay for a lot of these things. And we'll have to work on figuring out how we're going to get food there because that's a little bit different. But the districts, they see they're getting the publicity. They're getting all of the accolades. And in a district like mine that has declining enrollment, whenever they can have things that are in the newspaper, they want it. And so the little bit that that costs, you know, and I said three to 500 per art show, if you could figure it out, and that's about what we're spending, about $500 in art show, with all of us together splitting the costs, um, mostly. <laughs> because it's next to my room, I end up buying stuff and doing it in between. <laughs> but, <laughs> so that's a piece that's definitely gotta be part of your plan, is securing funding, and it's talking to, going to board meetings, and talking to community members. Uh, before our first art show, we did, uh, I'm not the technology guy, so I, or lady actually, but uh, one of those online forums for donations, and I can't think of what it is, you all, what is it? Donors choose. Donors choose. So we had, I want to say, we had uh, 30 pieces of map board that are like, um, 40 inches wide and uh, 60 inches tall donated from that. And we are still, we're on the last few pieces of that. And so um, we haven't done formal framing. Usually we just mat the pieces and put them on the wall. Um, but those are things. Gallery stands, I went and borrowed them from my, uh, I went to Pitzer College, it's down the road. I went and borrowed gallery stands for our first show. We still haven't made gallery stands because it's time and money. So until we get there, we're gonna do whatever we can to make these things happen. Um, but now we have a PO for all of our uh, posters and flyers and postcards. Yes. Are you starting to see kids the bridge, you know, kids walking over the bridge and going into art school now? Um, it's too early, to, it's too early to, to see that that's happening yet. But I have your data to bring back. To, but um, it's super powerful to have those people that worry about that kind of data. And I'm talking, once again, when I'm talking about the ed services people and the people that all are under that umbrella, they're gonna come in to your art show because you invite them. And when they come in and they see that something that looks absolutely different than they expect, something that is so authentic with a real opening, we usually have the high school jazz band playing outside and have an overall night that is very powerful. And when they come in and have that experience and they see people in our uh, community that are coming and visiting and seeing that experience, and then they see that there's a reporter that comes in and, and makes a little piece on it, it that's, that narrative is, is really pow more powerful right now before, but we will be providing them that data. Because we, we've been trying, we've been getting kids coming back. I, we had a, two girls come back, and I didn't even know they were at Art Center, and because they hadn't been connecting with us. And so, um, learning about and just promoting this, there's going to be some momentum. This paper has a lot of stuff 
that is real technical on it, but it's in a basic form. If you have any questions, please email me and I will send you more um, fleshed out stuff about organizing. On the last page is a one and a half page document by a very, very famous organizer named Marshall Gans. And this piece so perfectly sums up what it means to be an organizer and then just applying that as an educator or teacher organizer instead of thinking about you entering into your community. You're entering into your profession and doing these things. You know, and just the first paragraph. Uh, organizers identify, recruit, and develop leadership. Build community around leadership and build power out of that community. Uh, organizers challenge people to act on behalf of shared values and interests. They develop the relationships, understanding, and action that enable people to gain new understanding of their interests. New resources and new capacity. I think that's it. Capacity. We are all so much more powerful and able to do things because we as human beings have nearly limitless capacity to grow and do stuff that we never thought. I'm speaking in front of you. I'm not a great speaker, but I'm communicating. That's what matters, is that we understand each other. Capacity and desire will get your art gallery where it needs to be. And if there's any nuts and bolts, please email me, and I'm happy to share wherever we're on the journey and help you out with anything. No matter where you are, you know, email goes where it goes. So thank you for coming. I hope this helped, and if you have any questions, I'll be here for a minute.